Hey, Justin. Hey, Sal. You ever notice how much quieter it is when Adam's not around? <laughs> it's oh. like this weird, like, calm. It's so relaxing. You know? like, I can gather my thoughts. <laughs> it's so and, good. Uh, articulate things without the, getting interrupted. The mirror's not occupied all the time. <laughs> I know. But all that cool stuff. I'll be honest, though, with all that, uh, I miss that energy. I do a little you know? bit. And uh, this month's promotion was uh, Adam's idea. It was. The promotion for- uh, We should the, keep going with it. We should. And so here's the promo. This is, what, this is what happens. If you enroll in one of our top bundles, the RGB bundle or the MAPS Super Bundle, you will get uh, two t-shirts for under a dollar. So any your pick, by the way. It could be Short a MAPS shirt. Super Califragilistic Expedition. Right. Uh, it could be, I don't know what you just said. You yeah. could get a MAPS shirt. It could be a Mind Pump shirt. We have the new- Kettlebell mic shirts, uh, if those are still available. Which are get, hot. They're awesome. Uh, under a dollar for two of them if for enrolling in one of those two bundles. Now, don't forget, the RGB bundle is MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. That's nine months of broken down exercise programming. Or take it to the next level, get the Super Bundle, which includes MAPS Prime and MAPS uh, Anywhere. Not for everybody, but uh, for the most awesome people. It's for the most awesome people. If you're not awesome, don't get that. But yeah. if you're awesome- Don't even bother. Then you should do those and get your t-shirts. You can find this all at mindpumpmedia.com. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. What you're going to hear in this episode uh, is Mind Pump interviewing uh, and being interviewed by Dr. Brett McCabe. We've had him on before and we, we love his take uh, you know, in the sports psychology world, I love to hear him break these athletes' minds down and how to better your mind, even if you're not an athlete. He's a sports and performance psychologist. And what a lot of people don't realize is in sports, in performance, uh, especially at high levels, the, the, the limiting factor for a lot of people is the mental part of it. Yeah. So we get into that and we actually get into a lot of things he in this podcast. He breaks us down a little bit in there at some point. He breaks us down a little bit, which is <laughs> pretty cool. uncomfortable. You get yeah. to hear another side of us. So it's, no, it's pretty good, interesting. Though. He's also the author of a book called The Mind Side Manifesto. He also hosts his own podcast called The Mind Side Podcast. And the website you can find this at is www.themindside.com. He's also on Instagram at Dr. Brett McCabe. Now, Brett is spelled B-H-R-E-T-T. McCabe is M-C-C-A-B-E. Or you can also go to at the mind side. That's got to be Irish or Scottish, right? Say the name in McCabe. Irish. McCabe. Uh, you made hey, McCabe. There you go. You made yeah. it Italian at first. Yeah, my bad. Now it's Irish. Okay. Uh, so without any further ado, here we are talking to Dr. Brett McCabe. This guy got introduced to Snapchat today. He's like a tw- he's like <laughs> a tw- he's like a twelve year old. Oh my right god! Now. He's so excited. What's the first one he does? The one that puts lipstick and eye <laughs> yeah. makeup on. Yes, he puts- <laughs> of course. You know, I'm not. It made me look pretty. And that's fancy. one thing though. Snapchat's one thing I haven't gotten into. You know what? So, Can I, I tell you something right now? Yeah. It's, just wait. It's it is amazing. It is fucking impossible to understand. <laughs> I, that's my point. It is. It makes no sense. Listen yeah. to them. Which so, is probably some these old, old okay. So when I downloaded it, because yeah. to me it's like having way too many baseball cards when I was a kid. It's like a whole nother brand came out. Another brand. I'm like, shit. I can't. <laughs> I can't keep up with it. I so I downloaded Snapchat, and my 16 year old daughters. I'm like, how do you find people? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She goes, you just hit, you know, that thing where it goes into your contacts. I'm like, but I don't want them to know I'm following them or I'm not following them. Right. I don't want them to get an invitation. It's or a something. whole new set of operating skills. Yeah. It's like, what's going so on? So this is, we, we brought Taylor in. That's exactly what his, his job is to come in and teach us to be younger. So that's yeah, what we, I get it. we, yeah. we all had He's to trying have, to make us hip. We had this little, we're losing our cool factor. This powwow sure. about, we'll be uh, 44 and, and not having it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, it happens. I lo- yeah. quickly. You I, know? I it, well, I never had it in the first place. I don't notice anything. Yeah. Like, I don't notice I lost it. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Uh, but that's uh, usually yeah. how it happens, though. Yeah, so, you know, you, you're still wearing the same wardrobe, and it's. Oh, past. yeah. That's what's happened. Yeah, I know. We I just mean, called them out on we, that. Uh, we get it. Let's get into the psychology of this. This is the perfect man to talk about oh, this. Oh, that's, that's, that's true. We were just discussing this the other day. How, what is that that causes us to get stuck in an era? In a decade? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody does it. Yeah. We all, and it, you start, you stop at, an, at one point in your life, whether it be in the 20s, 30s, 40s, doesn't matter. Everybody gets stuck in the an 20s. era. The 20s. They, yeah. They're listening to the same music they were listening to and they're wearing the same shit they were wearing to. What yeah, is that? But you know what's crazy about that is, is when you go back and look at pictures when you were a kid of the people you thought were old, yeah, and then you look at yourself now and you're older than that person that you thought I was ancient. That. Yeah, it happens all the time. Like I, I used to, that. I used to look at my mom and think, you know, 
and now I look back, I'm like, my God, she's the same age I was when I thought she was like old. Yeah. <laughs> like ancient. Yeah. And I think, I think, I don't know what the phenomenon is called or why the hell we keep wearing the same clothes and stuff like that. I think it's comfort. I also think it's just people don't want to get out of their comfort zones. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. that's more of what it is. Is well, it's you know we I think spe- a lot. We, we look, I, I, okay, look when the whole skinny jean fad came on, <laughs> I'm not built for skinny jeans. <laughs> so if you see me in skinny jeans, then you know I'm like some British guy that was overweight and ate too much porridge. I mean, just let it go. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what I think it is. Here's the thing. Porridge I think is disgusting. I think what yeah. drives fashion because if you look at fashion, I don't know if, if this, guys, guy, this guy this guy's going to tell us about fashion I'm right on, now. I know. This guy's good. Let's hear. I'm this. about mm, to educate you. Pull, I hope you're recording, Doug. I'm about please. to educate you, Adam. <laughs> Everybody, sit down. Let's. let's Did listen. you guys know that with high fashion, there used to be only a few seasons. There used to be a few or a couple seasons yeah. a year, and now. Now there's tons of seasons because they're trying to churn and burn. There's 52, they want you, there's 52 a year now. They want you to buy clothes and get rid of the old ones because the faster they move through trends, the more mm, clothes they can right. sell. And fashion is really driven by people trying to fit in, people trying to look like. And the way they, they set trend is they'll have trendsetters who are typically celebrities or whatever wear these things. Once yeah. you see somebody cool with it on or who's perceived as being cool, that becomes a new trend yeah. and everybody thinks it's cool. And when you get older, you just become wiser and you don't care. You see that and you're like, that's stupid. I'm not going to wear that. It's like and that's Brad all. Pitt like stops at a truck stop and puts a hat on. Whoa, trucker hats. It's so in. Exactly. Yeah. So I just yeah. think you get wiser. And that trucker hat had been planted yeah. you know, yeah. by yeah. somebody yeah. to put that on and just you know throw yeah. it on like yeah. you just got the tag still on it. No, exactly. Exactly. Well, we here, yeah, but we, we I, went just, a little, I, just, I just never felt we for went it. a little fur, further here because I, I, I think that when we're yeah. when we're younger, a lot of a lot of that is driven by our insecurities, right? Like I want to fit in, I want to look cool, I want to feel cool, and so we do those things. Then we get an age where you go like, oh, then you realize like you connect the dots, like oh my god, I don't need to do this to fit in or look a certain way. Yeah. I don't. And then I, I I remember this. I went through a like. Levi's and Hanes white t-shirt only closet for like two years, like nothing but white t-shirts and just Hanes. And then I think there's an, then the, then I come full circle again and I go like, well, there is something to be said about dressing nice and feeling good, like cleaning yourself up, mm. wearing a nice outfit that actually mm-hmm. goes together. So I think that you're just still stuck in the, I don't give a fuck here. May- that's all. Maybe, or I, I feel cool regardless. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I am cool. You're therefore. comfortable in I your own cool, skin. I am cool, therefore yeah. I am. Yeah. 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 You, I'm, I'm, you guys don't understand. There, there is something cool about a guy, though, or a person who sets their own trend. And at first we look at them and go, mm-hmm. God, they're so out there. Mm-hmm. But then you, you kind of grab it. I mean, you get it. Yeah. It's like it becomes their identity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm probably... It's the confidence And I'm just going to warn you guys, like just so you guys know ahead of time, I'm like one or two steps away from just being naked all the time. So well, well, let's, not, yeah. let's not Don't start that today. Too Listen, we're not going to have any more yeah. guests over if you yeah. start talking let's like that. Let's not get that. Especially let's if not, that's your same seat in your same sofa. No, I sit in that. <laughs> you sit in this one? Yeah, okay. That's great. <laughs> where I'm right. sitting. You know, Brett, the last yoga naked on top of that. Naked hot yoga. Spray yourself down with some Myconazole. God. Brett, the last time we talked... I, I I wanted to ask you something. You, have you seen the movie Moneyball, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, what's your theory on um, meeting oh, a meeting a player like going. and judging about his character by his girlfriend? You remember that part where he says that? Where he says if his girlfriend's a a six, she's not hot. He definitely doesn't have confidence. Yeah, you know I, I've heard that. Uh, <laughs> so I've heard that by some college football coaches too. Is you look at which college football coaches are going to be better by judging their wives, because if they're <laughs> good recruiters, they're going to have they're going to outkick their coverage, right? Yeah. <laughs> And they got closing <laughs> skills. Yeah, they got closing skills, and it is it is an impressive thing. I mean, you know, we were at the game last night, and the tickets that were left for us at the Giants game were by folks that were, um, you know, family. And so we were kind of sitting around, and I, I mean, I was doing the same thing. I was looking like, you know, which guys, you know, got married after they were, you know, it, and which guys got married to the one that they've been dating since they were High twelve. School. Yeah. yeah, 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 and you know. So I think there's some, you know, who's that confidence guy? But you know, the confident guy is usually the one that doesn't really have the most, you know, skill set mm. or in life. I mean, it's always the guy that you look at who at the bars that picks up all the girls. Right. It's not the one you go, oh God, that guy would be the one to pick up all the girls. Yeah, mm. it's the guy that's got to overcompensate, and they end up being successful. Yeah, you know, d- let's define confidence though. Let's define that for a second because you hear people talk about like, oh, that person's so confident. It's, I feel like sometimes it's hard to. It's kind of hard to define because some of the characteristics of someone who's confident can come across as just cocky in someone else. I mean, what does it look like? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, uh, confidence, I guess confidence is kind of like how the Supreme Court defined pornography. 
<laughs> you know it when you no, see it. You that know is when an you awesome see it. Awesome analogy Whoa. for that. Yeah, <laughs> you don't remember. Yeah, that's that's a real thing. That's literally yeah. what they said. I'll know it when I see it. Yeah, I'll know it when I see it. I can't define it. the Larry Flint case. Is, I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. Mm. I think that's what it is with confidence because, you know, working with elite athletes, I've got athletes that may sit there and apologize for the success that they have, but when they're in the heat of the moment, they're confident. Mm-hmm. Okay, so do we define that person as being confident? I know people who are brilliantly confident in in life, but they go into work. They're not confident, mm-hmm. and yet they're brilliant. So to me, confidence is this fleeting moment of knowing what you're able to do. To me, I had an athlete, and I kind of wrote it out on a board one day. I had an athlete, we're talking about how to build confidence, and success and the results don't always build confidence. Because if that was the case, then you, you, you wouldn't believe you were going to be successful until you had results, but how do you get results if you can't be sure. successful? Sure. So to me be- – Confidence leads to belief, and belief is the the true master of who we are. If you believe in yourself, if you believe in your ability, you can overcome anything. So belief is, I'm always able to meet the demands of the moment. I believe in my ability, okay? What leads to belief is confidence. Confidence is, I know I can do this when it matters. What leads to confidence is trust. Trust, I can do these things, these individual things, and I know I get consistent results. That leads to confidence, which leads to belief. Well, how do we trust? Well, we build a plan to get there. Hmm. And what's the plan come from? A vision. So to me, vision leads to a plan, leads to trust, leads to confidence, leads to belief. But that goes up and down during the course of the time because one of the things that we do as people is once we hit a certain level of competence, we change the game. We're not comfortable staying where we want to stay. Hmm. We got to continue to push and we're moving to new domains all the time. So let's take a look at you guys, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm blown away walking into this studio, and those are the people who are listening on the podcast. I want you to understand, this is impressive. Thank you. And you guys have a vision, all right? Thanks. And, you know, to me, I was I was driving down the road, and I'm like, okay, where is this joint? And I walk in, and I'm like, God, this is this is sweet. Like, I'm sitting here in my back of my head going, how the hell am I going to build this in my office? Because <laughs> it's that cool, right? <clears throat> and But you guys have a vision. It takes a lot of sacrifice to get there. So when you first started, you probably said, here are my benchmarks that I want to hit. And you got confident at that. And now it's going to go to the next one. So what happens in two years if South uh, you know, South by Southwest, whatever it's called, calls you? Mm. Because you guys are a phenomenon. There's going to be a moment where like, damn right, let's go do it. And then there's going to be a little thought in the back of your mind going, but God, are we at that level? Because you identify other people and go, they're at that level. But you already are at that level. So that's why confidence kind of waxes and wanes a little bit, because we always change our target. We as people are not content. We we don't survive on contentment. If we did, we wouldn't you know continue to procreate. We wouldn't grow, and our species would have not evolved. So when we become content, um, we stop living. So confidence has always got to be this thing that it builds, and then it gets depleted, and then you get hungry again, and you start going again. You know, I think a lot of us look for false ways of confidence, which is the amount of people we put around us, our followers. I mean, look at today's society. It's defined by how many Instagram followers you have. Mm-hmm. They're hollow. Right. I mean, it's changing the, the, the young ladies market. I mean, women are being defined by their Instagram followers, how many likes they get because of how they look. Do you find yourself yeah. speaking to this already? Like, are you having to talk to you? I thought you were going to ask, do I find myself looking at likes about how I look? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no. I've no. lost that Every battle. Day. No. Every day. No, I, no. Do you... I wax up and, and oil down and <laughs> yeah. I stand in the mirror and take a Ooh. selfie. Yeah. Do, you, do you find yourself I'm talking? I'm following you, sir. Yeah, you should. <laughs> <laughs> Spe- speaking to young athletes about this already. You know, I had a conversation yesterday. We were... Um, a very, very successful club with some very successful members. And I said, if you look back at the 1980s, you guys are too young for the 80s. Um, I don't know how old you are. We were babies. You were babies, yeah. And um, Doug's 70, so he was yeah, a, he's, yeah. he's right there with you. So the 80s was this idea, right, of you can do anything if you put your mind to it and get after it. And it was the, the power of the 80s. Anything is possible. The Reagan era, we are proud to be in this world a lot of, of self-fulfillment. Yeah. yeah. It was, it's yeah, actually the decade. People don't realize that 80s is the decade that made uh, really modern America. It's what brought it is. America to become the sole it, world CNN, superpower. CNN did an amazing documentary called This is the 80s or mm-hmm. We Are the 80s. Incredible. It was all about self-fulfillment, but it was there was this thought of work your ass off, 
get after Very it, much. the American dream, right? Mm-hmm. And it came out of the World War II, which was the World War II folks, because you remember, those were the parents of the kids in the 80s. Mm-hmm. World War II is we defined our culture, we defined our society. The 60s was you know a lot of pride. The 70s was expansion, and then it came back into, okay, let's build. The 90s was, you know, you can do anything you want if you come up with something innovative. And the 2000s was a little bit that. The generation today is, I can do anything. And they forgot the other two parts. <laughs> <laughs> that's so well said. So yes. because they forgot the other two parts, that's why we've got snowflakes. That's mm. why we got people who get pissed off so easily. They mm. get their feelings hurt when you don't tell them something's not right. Versus going, look, I'm always going to have adversity. I've got to build confidence. I'm going to grow. And it's working to get to that level. So what happens is we got, instead of people who are dreamers and builders, we got a lot of frustrated, pissed off people that have no no money in the bank and no emotional money in the bank, no confidence money in the bank. Mm. And so they walk around frustrated and then they start transferring blame to everybody telling why they got screwed over versus saying, you know what, let me get my hands in the dirt. Now, driving around here and, and driving up uh, 280 and 101 and seeing Silicon Valley, it's inspiring to think that these small businesses were created with a plan and now they're world powers. I mean, I, you, you feel the sense of innovation here and you see that and you guys are in the seat of that mm-hmm. now you guys probably take it for granted because well, you totally right well yeah. mo- more so many of these companies are not even 10 years old and they oh. run the world yeah i mean google hasn't been around that long and it yeah, literally google netflix apple we got them all in our backyard I mean, facebook all of yeah. them it's crazy but you know what you're talking about you know with the with the decades leading up to the 80s and then you know coming to now it's like you have you know, tough times, you know, the 60s was like this, you know, expansion, learn about ourselves, kind of break free from some of these societal molds. The 70s was excess in that in that particular regard. We had, you know, our economic system was horrible at the time, which bred the 80s. And it's almost like tough times makes good people. Good people bring good times. Good times makes weak people. Weak, t- weak people make bad times. And it's like this cycle that yeah, you see. Yeah, absolutely. And what we've had from 80s, 90s to now is a lot of good times, a lot of growth, yeah. a lot of good times, and a lot of like take that shit for granted. Yeah. Like well, you know, easy. look at the, what the, I mean, I'm not a finance guy. We're not going to get into finance here, but look at where the Dow Jones is right now. We're supposedly not in a great economic time. Yeah. It's all time high. Yeah. And I don't understand. I mean, we, we make decisions. We, we refine. I mean, it's the same thing in life. We grow, we grow, we do, we learn, we grow, we do, we learn. The learning is the part that nobody wants to do. Hmm. Everybody wants to grow, do, succeed, grow, do, succeed. But if you don't learn, you keep repeating the same problems. And, you know, I think mentally or psychologically, that is where a lot of people struggle is they fail to learn, so they repeat their lessons. Well, you want to stay – what causes people to grow? It's pain. Uh, absolutely. It, nobody grows from comfort and well, where everything's great. You have to go into pain, and nobody wants to be pain. So who? what was the fertilizer back in the day? You know, before we had – it was cow shit. Mm. So I always tell people when you when you plant your seeds, you have to push through a lot of crap to succeed. Mm-hmm. And that's what fertilizer is. Mm-hmm. you got to push through inches of crap in order to push through to that higher level. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that. They want to buy it in a pot already and say, you just give me the one last step to go. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what brand you're building. It doesn't matter what athletic environment you're building. There's, there are those who will do whatever it takes and are willing to make any sacrifice necessary to succeed. And we continue to see those patterns continue to succeed. But what I'm afraid of is in our society today is we don't see that as a, as the standard. We see that as, uh, they're just different, Mm -hmm. but you know, to me, to be successful and to build that confidence and have a vision and a plan is you got to do the uncommon things to become extraordinary. What think, are what are coaches having to do with athletes now than, that's different than 20 years ago? Because now they're dealing yeah. with the everybody gets a trophy generation. Yeah, well, everybody gets a trophy generation is the parents, okay? Mm. The kids, um, and, and, and because of travel ball and AAU and all these, they're going to play five games in a weekend. So for me growing up as a baseball player, you know, we may play two games in a weekend, but it was live or die. Now they're going to play five in a weekend. It doesn't matter if we went three and two. I mean, we want to win, but it's okay. And so parents are, are coddling the kids. Like, it's okay. It's okay. You got another bat. You know, you're doing good. And a little bit is there's a, there's a researcher out of around here by the name of Carol Dweck who, who coined the term growth mindset mm-hmm. and said that there are two types of mindsets of people. There's a fixed mindset where people are always trying to prove what they're capable of. And then, you know, so there's a stress and they don't grow a lot. And then there's the growth mindset, which is, 
really one of the greatest words you can use is the word yet. I haven't figured it out yet. Mm -hmm. In other words, I will. I believe in my abilities, but I'm learning every day. We've become so growth mindset when somebody struggles, we're like, it's okay, you'll get it soon. And so we, we don't allow them to feel the adversity and the struggle. So we say, move it off. Well, then they go to elite colleges and are playing, and the coach doesn't want to say, it's okay. They want to say, figure it out as soon as you can because I'm relying on you. And the kids sit there with this attitude of like, why are they being hard on me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's because nobody's ever been hard on them. Right. Yeah. Because what happens if they're hard? Mom and dad go to the school and say, coach is being hard. Look, the num- in Alabama, where I live, high school football is so prominent that high school coaches are making significant money and they're being fired after losing seasons. Now, remember, they are teachers at a school first, (laughs) but most of them don't teach anymore. Hmm. They are a full-time football coach. Now, they may teach a driver's ed over the summer, but their job is to be a football coach. Well, they get 10,000 people at a football game, you know, on on a good game. So there's this pressure. Well, if the parents don't like what's going, what do they do? They create a movement to eliminate the coach. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's happening in college. Oh, wow. Yeah. And if you get enough parents who are going to the athletic directors and in the and the compliance department and all that, they they can come up. This isn't the Baylor situation. That was god awful and should be that that athletic department should be blown up for the rape cases. But we're talking about coaches that may I mean I've heard situations and worked with people who've the coach got fired because their tone with the players was not constructive. Oh my God, really? Wow. Yeah. Hell? yeah. Wow. And it just builds. And so you turn, you cross one parent, that parent, you know, apathy spreads like a virus. So if, I, if I'm ticked off and feel powerless in my situation and I choose to feel that way, then I'm going to try to recruit you because it's easier for me to recruit you to see my side than to change my perspective. Right. Mm-hmm. So I may miss on you, but I'll find you because <clears throat> you're ticked off about something too. Mm-hmm. And I may find you, and then all of a sudden, one to three to 10, and all of a sudden, we have a movement now. Mm-hmm. And it started from discontent. Hmm. And so that once that weighs with athletic directors and those organizations, unless that coach has unbelievable clout and respect over years, the, they don't want to deal with it. Wow. Because it's just easier to move on. So that parent unwound... And, and I think parents, they do it inadvertently at first. They love their kids so much that they're actually hurting them. Yeah. Hmm. You know, I have, I have two kids, and I, it hurts me just like any other parent when I see my children uh, fail at something or try something and not do what they thought they could do um, and, and to experience pain, lose a game or get a bad score on a test or whatever. I love my kids more than anything, and I see that. But I also savor those moments because I know that the lessons – with, there's lessons within those moments. It's an opportunity. I always look at it that way. Like, okay, they just lost the game, performed poorly. Right. Here's a great opportunity to teach my kid something. And I actually had this uh, this with my daughter uh, not that long ago. She came home and she, you know, prides herself in doing good in her schoolwork, and she likes to show me and you know what she did. And she came home and she showed me that she got a, she did a test or whatever. And she's only in first grade, and she got eight out of ten. And she showed me. You know, look, you know, Papa, I got eight out of ten. You know, that's that's really good. And I said, uh, "Do you think it's really good?" And she said, "I think so." And I said, "Did you try really hard with this test?" And she's like, um, "I think so." I said, "Did you try your hardest?" And she's like, "I don't." She was confused. Like, what do you mean? And I said, "Do you think you could have got those other two right if you had tried harder?" And you could see the wheels turning. And she said, "Well, yeah, but isn't this good?" And I said, if you think it's good, it's good. I said, but don't tell yourself you tried your hardest if you didn't. And I'm just being honest with her. I'm not pressuring her or anything. And I just want her to understand that, uh, you know, if if you do your absolute best, that's something you got to be honest with. And then if you get an eight or a 10, then that's fine. But Mm -hmm. if you get an eight, but you could have done better, be honest with yourself. And and if you're okay with that, that's okay. Yeah. And I've Mm -hmm. had those conversations with my kids and people cringe but the reality is you don't it's not like you're putting undue pressure on that. It's not like I'm saying you're grounded or you know you need to be a particular way or whatever because it's not a bad thing that she did or you know that kids will do. But they they themselves understand that they can do better if they work harder and that they didn't apply themselves fully, which is okay again, but it don't lie to your kids. That's what I hate. I hate when parents lie to their kids. You watch your kid play a sport and you can obviously tell your kid's not trying. And then they lose and it's like, oh, it's all right, buddy. You gave it a good... Don't lie to your kid. Like, tell them, like, look, you lost, 
because you weren't really trying. I could tell yeah. you weren't really tr- you know trying while you were playing, and that's fine if that's what you want to but do. But what I want parents to understand though is, and and people who are listening to this is, when you're judging that, don't don't just judge the behavior. Ask why the behavior is happening. So are they not trying because they're afraid? Are they not trying because they don't understand? Are they not understanding? Are they not trying because they don't believe in themselves? Are they not? Are they not trying? Because they're actually overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. And one thing I always tell parents is when you're coaching your kids in life, in school, in anything, be very careful to judge the not trying because it's like I'm open up a MacBook and you opened up too many apps and then you decide to open up iPhoto. And now you get the circle, the spinning circle of death, mm-hmm. right? The computer looks like it's not trying. Mm-hmm. What's really happening is there are six things behind the scenes that are spinning. And those six, six things behind the scenes are spinning so hard that it's working down its ability to engage. Mm. And that's what the athletes are doing. So, and, and kids too. But what you said was so brilliant is, look, as parents, we can't tell them it's okay all the time. It's going to be, you'll you'll work through this. That's what I want people to tell them. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, not, it's not, it's okay. So in school, if you only make A's, what are you learning? Exactly. There's a problem there. I, every one of us knows our instructors. I know my instructors in high school, college, grad school, even my supervisors on residency or internship. They would sit there, and I can remember the ones that got their foot up my rear end, told me I wasn't good enough in something, and I thank them for doing that. Now, if they were sitting in this room, would I be still probably a little elevated heart rate and a little nervous around them? Heck yeah. <laughs> but that's what makes us better. I mean, think about you guys on y'all's business and your vision. What in the last six months, what have y'all screwed up? Oh, that plenty. you've gotten better about plenty. Oh, uh, well, let's let's talk about an example though. Well, this let's is, no, let's 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 do talk everything. About, let's no, no, no. <laughs> we yeah. literally were just talking about it off air. Is this um, the social media thing? And for us, we're a media company. Yes, it's kind of important that we got that down. <laughs> you yeah. know, but yet we're also thirty five plus years old. So we there's a major disconnect for from these platforms. And there's a part of us that wants to say we don't need it. We're we're fucking good enough to build this podcast, build this business without it because we've already got enough people that are listening to us, that are calling us, that are emailing us and kind of neglected it. And we kind of half-ass did it. And there's now been this realization that we need to focus on this. This is going to be not only a major part of our business, but in the next 10 plus years, it will become a, a necessary for this generation that's coming up. So we have to learn this, especially if we're going to be a media company. So the steps, the growth that we've had just in the last month. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna interrupt you. You just hit me when you thought, probably because I'm drinking that coffee. Um, <laughs> it's good stuff. It is great stuff, and I'm sitting here, and my mind is going like four thousand miles an hour. <laughs> I warned you. <laughs> um, and and but it's like okay, I'm, I'm gonna out myself here. You know, watching Friends, the, the show Friends. Yeah. yeah okay, sure. everyone watches it, right? You guys did, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank totally. You. Totally. Friends and Seinfeld. Yeah, yeah sure. Seinfeld. Yeah. yeah, go back and watch Seinfeld. I'm not I'm not as hip on as I used to. No, be. really. The acting is not as good as it was. Mm. But anyway, <clears throat> but when you look at how that show evolved, okay, that was an impressive evolution of a show. That's why it's stayed around so long. It's exactly right. They were innovative and mm. they did things differently. And it wasn't like they were doing crazy laugh tracks or anything like that. The writing was innovative. And I think that's why Big Bang Theory is kicking ass right now, too. Hmm. It is pushing the limits, but not the limits of raunch. It's pushing the limits of what we are comfortable in and learning from. But if you go back and look at the early sets of Friends to where it finished, it was more visually entertaining. It was more engaging. I think it was a, it's an amazing thing to look back. So everybody evolves, mm-hmm. right? But we're talking before we went on air, right, of how these social media platforms are changing everything. Mm-hmm. Where are we going to be in ten years? Right, yeah, who knows? Yeah. and it's scary for us at our age. I mean, we're we're about to add a, a social media and marketing person in our business because we need somebody who's got a pulse. Well, what are we going to hire a fourteen year old? <laughs> right, because I need to know exactly what's happening in the business because that's our clientele. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's intimidating to me. It is, it, you know, something you said earlier. Uh, really struck hard for me. And you said, you know, and we were talking about kids, why maybe maybe they're not trying because of fear. And that really hit me because I think that is a bigger issue than we all realize, whether we're kids and an adult. And I'll tell you why. I'll use myself as an example. This is why it hit me so hard. When I was in elementary school, um, I was always on honor roll. 
And school was for me was just it was so unmemorable. It was so easy. I'd show up and I'd get A's and it was like mm-hmm. whatever. So they sent a letter home to my mom and it was we wanted to test your son for, uh, for gate. Gate was gifted and something. I never that, got one yeah, of those. So, yeah. yeah. So it was like you know, my mom was so excited. Oh my god! I applied you, and failed. They're gonna test you. <laughs> they're gonna test you for gate. You're gonna take all these like really advanced classes and you know we're so proud of you and whatever. And I when I got the test. I was afraid to apply myself because there's there's it's one thing to fail when you're not trying because then you're like I don't even, I, yeah, mean, I don't care. So true. There's another thing to fail when you tried really fucking hard and that's scary. Yeah. Yeah. Very scary. That is the it hurts that more because it's because fa- you actually yeah. failed. Yes, yeah. you actually failed. So and I remember it. that distinctly. I distinctly remember failing on purpose because I don't want to. F- try hard and fail and mm. that's happened throughout mm-hmm. i've had to challenge myself with that throughout my whole uh, uh, adulthood like you're going to play a basketball game with someone or you're going to work out with someone or you're going to do something with someone and you're you're like well fuck this guy or this girl or whatever's better than me i'm just not going to try hard because if i don't try hard then it's okay that I lost or I didn't succeed, or I'm not going to try hard at this business. Like I totally can because if it fails, I can always look back and say, and that is huge. Yes, it's yeah. massive, and it's almost a fear of success. And that, mm. and I struggled mm-hmm. that when I was pitching in college, a fear of success that I was going to have to repeat that level of success yes. every time out. Yeah. And you're exactly right. People hold back because that hold back is their safety net mm-hmm. because they can look in the mirror and go, but if I had done that. It is hard to look in the mirror and say, I gave everything. And I still didn't and do I it. And I still failed. Yeah. And, and I look back at things in my life, and, you know, business. When I, when I left a very successful corporate job to go back into being a psychologist, I had this vision of what I wanted to be in the sports stuff, but I wanted to be raw. And I remember telling my wife, my daughter was a freshman in high school. She's now in her, finishing her second year of college. And we didn't have a, a college plan. I mean, mm-hmm. we were... I mean, we had kids young. Uh, we were in grad school, so we were trying to still put our stuff together. And I left a very successful job where a lot of my expenses were covered in life. I mean, most of my meals, my car, my car insurance, I mean, all health care. And here I am going out on my own. My wife didn't work. And I remember telling her, but I want to invest in, I want to bet on me. <laughs> and I said, look, if something happens, I could go back to work and find a job. <clears throat> mm-hmm. But I, I am going to do whatever it takes. And I tell everybody... I will lick the concrete out there for revenue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and now we're at a spot where I can be a little bit more selective. But I have done things, I'm not going to say that I'm ashamed of, um, but I've done <laughs> things that I look back and go, that was crazy. Mm-hmm. And But why don't we do that in everything in our life? And it took me to get to that point where it was something I really, really wanted. And I don't know if I'm going to succeed at this. I don't know what, how we even define success, mm-hmm. but it's just like you guys doing this. It's it's if you're if you always are holding back something, then you're not being authentic to you in the world. I, I believe people wear two things: they wear a mask because they show the world what the what the world wants them to see, or they think they want they, what we think the world wants to see. Correct, right. coffee, no problem. Um, <laughs> and we also wear a backpack, hmm. and our backpack is every burden and fear. We just keep fill in our backpack. So the problem is that what we're trying to display to the world is this perception of what we think the world needs to see from us. Mm-hmm. We're making an assumption that's not even accurate. Right. You know, that's why when we when we really strip it all down, we take off our mask and we sit there and we go, I am who I am me. Yeah. It's actually where connection happens. That's why in relationships, when we become truly vulnerable to each other, usually after an argument, I mean, that's why the passion is so high after an argument is we're vulnerable, Hmm. okay? But in our world, we don't want to take off that mask. If you think about just in your industry, fitness, I know in my industry, in the mental game, there's so many masks being worn. Oh, God, it's worse in our industry, I think. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. so superficial. It's so superficial. And, you know, there's so many people that have these, these businesses that are bigger than they really are. And I'm not, I'm not saying that you can't do that, but- they project themselves as, you know, oh, yeah. flying on private jets and doing all this. And then, you know, they leave the tarmac and then they, you know, take the Greyhound. Yeah. Well, what's great is all that is, is I mean, upending. Like the, the tide is turning with that. And I think yeah. that I could even attribute a lot of our success to that simple fact alone that 
we really had to come out and be honest and and challenge ourselves to be vulnerable like that and let people know the real deal, like the behind the scenes things, like what what you really need to okay, focus but on. But what did it take when, when I asked you when we were sitting out there yeah. about your business right? and you guys are doing this full time? And that's why I asked the question mm. is, do you guys still have a training business? Mm-hmm. Because I was waiting to see is, is this all in or is this just testing the water? Mm. Oh, yeah. Now, I love the fact that y'all are all in. No, we're all in. Yeah. And that makes you hungry. You have to take the mask off because now you can't see fully when you have a mask on. Mm. So when we are willing to go all in, now you didn't do it recklessly. You had a plan. But the also the other backside is these burdens that we carry, filling you know the perceptions of our parents, our family, our friends, the fears and the doubts. We carry that and it weighs us down. Look, cl- clear out your backpack, take off your mask and be you. you that's what you guys do. That's why your, your, your media, the podcast and YouTube, it engages because it is you. Mm-hmm. There, is, there are warts. There are mistakes. There are, you know, oh, look, that's, let's go back. But I'm not afraid to leave everything on the table. Well, one thing we did uh, or, and we continue to try to do is, number one, uh, we challenge each other. And more, I have grown, I'll tell you what, uh, I have grown, personally grown, more in the last two and a half years that I've been working with these gentlemen than I did in the previous, you know, 20. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I mean I'm not exaggerating. I would say the same thing. And it, it, it's two things. Number The first thing is uh, you almost have to learn to enjoy the painful growth process and seek it out. Because if you don't, you constantly run from it. So it's like, oh, here's an opportunity for growth. Here's some pain. Okay, cool. I love that. I got You got you to tell yourself you love it and go for it. And the second thing is... Early on, we, and this was not planned. This actually part wasn't planned. This was almost, I I hate to say instinctual, but it kind of happened this way where we branded ourselves, like it's part of our brand. It's part of Mind Pump to be vulnerable and to make mistakes. And one of the ways we do that is we let our audience constantly know the mistakes we make and what we're planning on doing and what we're doing. Very little is done behind the scenes where our, 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 your audience doesn't know about. And now it's part of our design, but in the, in, initially we just kind of did it that way. And it's really set us up well to where if we fuck up, when we will, for everybody fucks up, right? Mm-hmm. They're a part of the process. They understand it becomes a part of our brand and actually helps us because I think among all of the other, uh, you know, detriments to wearing a mask and a backpack is if you are that business, if you are that individual that wears a mask and a backpack and you're really good at it, because there's a lot of people that are really good at it. Oh, yeah. That master wearing a mask is the second there's a crack in that mask and people see through it, your business is fucked. Oh, Once yeah. you've built up that- And then they jump p- and then they destroy you. They, yeah. People yeah. love to the destroy The lynch mob shit. comes. Do you yeah. know how hard it is to make fun of or you know poke fun at uh, the three of us? Any of us. It's yeah. very difficult because we'll do it first. Yeah. And we'll laugh at it and have a good time with it. And now we've realized it's actually given us strength because- We've started that way. Whereas if you put out this persona all the time, like you see this with fitness personalities all the time, right? Uh, I'm always fit. I'm always ripped. I'm always buffed. I'm always yeah. strong. And then they'll be seen somewhere and they're off season and they're fat and they're whatever, or they're working out and they're moving like shit and somebody will catch them on camera or snap it. And next thing you know, that shit goes viral and it's ruined their brand. There's yeah. one gentleman uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, he puts that persona of being this tough, macho, buff, good-looking, super great guy. And I guess he was coming off, off an airplane and he had his hat off. And he's got like this total receding hairline and it's a picture. And that shit went viral and people making fun of him. That wouldn't have happened had he let himself be vulnerable and yeah. be himself from the beginning. But it's because he created this false. Oh, that's, I mean, we've been, we've, been, we've been teasing about my 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 thinning hair since the first day, <laughs> oh, right? No, I got it. So, <laughs> so, right? Here so, it comes. So when you, yeah. call, when you call it out like that, I mean, that that was uh, that is a lot of uh, mind pump raw truth. But I also think that that is going to be where everybody is going to have to go in the next 10, with all this ability to connect to Boy, us. how hard is it to wear a mask okay. now? Okay, well, it's it's... Well, we just find new and innovative ways to do it. Yeah, that's true. true. Okay, that's good but point. the truth is, our environment has no control over us unless we give it that control. Now, I know we all hear the thing: if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. I mean, I work every day. I work at getting better. Mm. I work at trying to be the best that I can be. So I'm working every day. Mm. I'm never off. And you know, I, I hear people say, if you just love, all this prosperity comes to you. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm the same. Oh, always, always. Yeah, the secret. On the yeah. You know what the magnet. problem with the secret oh, was? No, Tell me what God. the problem was. Fuck you, yes. book. Yeah. Here's the problem with the secret. Everybody loves it. It That's was the, the law of attraction. It wasn't the law of doing. <laughs> yeah. Everybody went out and bought this we book. We should write that book. Yeah, the yeah. law of doing. Yeah. yeah. You know, Step one, nobody yeah, would buy it. Find your goal. Step two, work to it. No, nobody work. nobody would buy it, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Nobody would buy it. It reminds me of the oh, joke. Man, of, that requires work. It reminds yeah. me of the joke yeah, exactly. of, of the guy who's like, he keeps praying to God and he wants to win the lottery and he prays and then he prays and prays and prays and then God finally, you know, he's talking to God and he's like, God, you know, I've been praying to you forever to win the lottery. What the fuck, man? I haven't won anything. God's like, you got to buy a goddamn lottery ticket. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) that's the secret. It was like, I can, it's going to come to me if I, if I attract this. Look, Mm. I'm a spiritual guy. I was raised Catholic. Um, I believe in spirituality. I believe spirituality is the step beyond religion where you don't ask, you know, I, I love organized religion. I don't personally attend an organized church right now, but, um, to me, religion is, when you go, you ask the question and somebody gives you the answer. Spirituality is knowing to ask the question then on your own search to find your own answers. Mm -hmm. And I think when we get to, and we're not going to go that way in this podcast, but I, um, but to me, that's what we're all about life. Right? So the secret is, you know, I'm going to attract it. I think what missed in the secret, or maybe the message was in there and it was missed was when people are in love with, with what they do and they're committed to growing, they become magnetic because they're asking questions to other people. They're learning from great leaders. They're, they become attractive to others because they're on a constant thirst. Mm-hmm. Nobody likes to hang around with a know-it-all. Right. Everybody loves to hang around people who have similar interests that are in similar mindsets, who are wanting to learn and hungry. That's why incubators work. Okay? That's why Silicon Valley has so much innovation. Because there are people you're out, surrounded by you're surrounded by innovative people who are asking questions and ripping the mask off for the most part and saying these are the warts with our business. Mm-hmm. Help me figure out this this policy. Let me and to your point, I mean, look at what we do with our with our celebrities. They're photoshopped and made up so perfectly that when they catch them walking the streets, there's an entire show of TMZ about it. Right, man. And it's it's what it's showing is, oh my God, she's she's you know she's not wearing her spanks today and. She's got a little jiggly going on, right? Mm-hmm. And everybody's freaking out. And the next thing you know, poor thing is having to restrict eating just to maintain this image. Well, I think it's hard, and this is just uh, human psychology. Maybe you can you can help me on this, but I think it's hard to truly understand how many opportunities you create for yourself simply because you're in a state of where you're, you're passionate about what you're doing. And we can use sports, like. If you're swinging a bat at a ball, the odds of connecting go up if you get more pitches thrown at you. It's just mm-hmm. the bottom line. Well, if I'm passionate about my business or I'm passionate about this growth or this whatever goals I have, I'm more likely to talk about it throughout the day. I'm more likely to connect to people who maybe have information that is related to what I'm looking to do. I'm more likely to meet people who may have influence in this particular field. And so really what's really happening, and it's very bla- it's very basic, is I'm just getting more balls pitched to me. I'm just, it's just more opportunities. And then when something happens, we're like, oh my God, it's serendipitous. It's like magic. No, I mean, really the reality is you're just giving more, getting more opportunities because you're following what you want to do. And and everybody can relate to this. When you're passionate about something, you tend to talk about it and think about it yeah, a lot. Yeah, I mean, get my you get God. annoying on people's nerves about it. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But to your point about how many doors you got to knock on in order to find the one that is your magic door. You know, we see overnight successes, but what we forget is there's a tons of sleepless nights and overnight successes. Oh yeah. And you know, there's very rarely is somebody ever. I mean, Pamela Anderson maybe was picked up off this at a football game. You know, where all of a sudden they said, you're going to be the next you know, superstar uh, for modeling. I mean, this is 25 years ago. That doesn't happen. No. And there's a vision. To me, great people have a stubbornness that is unremitting. The stubbornness is not stubborn about what they're doing. Well, there is that. I mean, there's if some media consultant came in and said, y'all got to change what you're doing. You got to do this. Y'all would probably say, that's not our vision. Right. Now, Help us, but don't change us. Mm-hmm. That's fine. You got to be stubborn to what your vision is. We fired three companies before Taylor. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. My point. <laughs> um, and the stubbornness is is not about being stubborn to say you can't take feedback. That's a mistake. The stubbornness is I am never going to give up. And what information, what thing in this environment am I going to 
am I going to allow to control my my innovation, my interest, my motivate? When we start giving power to our environment, then we're lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, we become within a hurricane or a tornado. I mean, we're just we're at the will of our environment. When we believe with a deep seated conviction of what we want to do, and we're willing to grow and be hungry and bring people in, then that's why they grow, and that's why we're successful. I mean, LeBron James may go down as one of the greatest basketball players of all time. He's truly innovative. But when he was first up, he he was a shooter from the outside and a driver. He didn't know how to post up. So when he had a mismatch and was up against a smaller guy, he lost his advantage. So he spent an entire summer with Akeem Olajuwon and said, teach me how to post up. So that dude with the greatest tools in the world went and found another tool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My God. Right. Yeah. So why are we looking for physical gifts all the time? Mm-hmm. It's what I call capacity. Can you meet the demands of the moment? And very few people have the balls to let it out and not worry about proving their underlying ability. That's called capability. Very few people are willing to sacrifice that discussion to say right here, right now, this is what we're living for. And I'm willing to do, I may not be a hundred percent, but damn, I can give 90%. Of, I can give a hundred percent of my 90 and I can meet the demands of the moment. Well, what do we have to let go of to do that? Fear. We have to have, have a lot of conviction of what we want. We have to let go of social acceptance. We have to let go of a lot of things. Now there are s- steps that you can do that'll help you with this. Uh, one of the things that I learned r- recently, and you hear this all, it's funny too, because y- you'll you'll learn things that you kind of knew or heard, but you never really got. And then one day you get it and you're like, oh, well that's, now I understand. You know, we, we all hear the whole, you know, the journey of a, a thousand miles begins with one step and, you know, the, you know, most of the, the problem or the, the stress or whatever that you're dealing with has to do with your own self and your own mind. Mm-hmm. And the actual thing you're stressed about isn't nearly as, as difficult or stressful as you Correct. think. And uh, I don't remember where I was hearing this. Uh, it, I think it was, uh, might have been a POW or someone who was talking about, like, how did you get through, you know, that period of time where you were just in this horrible conditions? And he said, well, I broke everything up into hours. You know, like, I can survive anything for 60 minutes. Like, if I think to myself, I'm going to be here for five years, I mean, that's ridiculous. It's daunting. Or if I'm going to run a marathon and I think of, you know, 26 miles, like, ah, but I know I can run half a mile. So I'm going to run a half a mile at a time. And I started applying this. I just, re- I, you know, uh, recently went through some very difficult times, kind of one after another. And uh, I started applying that. And instead of looking, oh, my God, you know, this is going to take two years to, to, to work out or, or, or organize. I just started breaking things up into like, weeks and days like okay today i'll do this and today next day i'll do this and before you know it you've gotten there and it's really you start to really realize how much of the difficulty in the things that you do are just you created them you create i mean and stress is a real thing we all need to have stress it motivates us to do certain things but when that stress becomes a cycle of worry and you start to suffer from it you start you're suffering and just thinking about this thing over and over again and you're not moving forward, that's when it becomes a problem. Well, and the reason it does that is because we give power to it. We give power to the things to impact us. And when we feel out of control is when we feel powerless. So it's a little bit of a cycle. But in life, if you go, that is a demand that I need to meet. That's what's called stress. Stress is an external demand or internal demand being placed on us. Mm. We don't know what we can handle until we fill up our dump truck. And so I always use an example for my, my clients and athletes Stress is how we know is a bridge that's over a big, uh, you know, crevice, right? A big canyon. And it has a weight limit. And that's great. They build it. Trucks go over it. No problem. When is the stress going to hit that? Well, we don't know until we overload it and we find the cracks. Then the engineers come in and say, we need to reinforce this. We need to reinforce that. If we looked at stress that way and said, look, stress will always find the crack. Water will always find a crack in us. So under stress will identify our areas of improvement. If we can take that, just like you, you found a new way to persevere versus feeling powerless. You found a strategy, a coping mechanism to push through. That is something that it will you know, help you in times because we go in cycles. So there's times that we're, we're flying and there's times that we're crashing. And if you don't learn how to overcome these, then we repeat those patterns because you have to learn the strategy and the strategy is yours. 
I can't use your strategy. I got to find my own. Yeah. Now I can say, I know that worked for you. Let me investigate it. But if you don't put your own stamp on it, then what you don't do is you don't know how to manage your own stress. So stress, I, I want people to look at stress as, man, that's a gift. Right. It is an absolute gift. It hurts terribly. Okay. We know the long-term effects on stress on the human body. It's it's well documented. It enhances just about every medical condition. It, it amplifies the the suffering that comes with it. It shortens lives. Okay, so we'll get out of that part. But it also allows us to go back and find what we need to do. Most of us try to add things under stress. Sometimes we need to eliminate. We need to learn, eliminate you know people who are sucking the energy off of us. We need to eliminate the tasks that aren't proven what we need it to be. We need to reinvest in ourselves. And that's taking control back and power back. And this is why the fitness industry, because that, that's our field, right? And I yeah. was, I can connect it very strongly, what you're saying, to the industry that we've all worked in for so long. This is why the fitness industry has done a such a poor job of solving the health problems that we're suffering in, you know, in, in modern societies. Like, if you look at, uh, obviously, you know, you, we'll just use American as an example, and we look at the obesity epidemic and the diabetes epidemic and the autoimmune disease epidemic and you know children now are displaying uh diseases that were only adults got correct and by the way this is now this has only been over the last 30 years i mean in 90 you know before the you know the 1980s i think it was children didn't get type 2 diabetes in fact it used to be called adult onset diabetes that was the name of it because it happened as an adult now yeah. we have kids have it and they change the name anxiety is another one you look at uh you know, four percent four percent of Americans oh, it's were diagnosed with anxiety in nineteen eighty. Today it's over half. Yeah. And you look at all these problems and the fitness industry grew along with it and it's done nothing to help it. And the reason why it's done nothing is it's not empowered people at all. Oh no. If anything, it's taken power away. Uh, we we market to insecurities. We poke at the insecurities to get them to buy things, knowing damn well that they're not going to succeed, that over 85% of them are actually going to fail. And we don't give a fuck because we're getting the money. Yeah. And, that, and yeah. so when, when you when You, you make look money at, off people not showing up. Uh, that's how gyms, gyms work. Well, that's how, yeah. They, <laughs> one of the that's large the boxes, yeah. I want to sell a bunch of memberships. We don't want you to show up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's crowded. Ooh. And that's crazy. It is crazy. Right? And to your point, anxiety is spiking in this country. And it's spiking because we, we never have, we're never off. These smartphones are constant. If you go on vacation, you need your phone. <laughs> but what's in your phone? Your emails, your tasks, everything, your messages, yeah. everything. So you can't turn off, right? We feel powerless to things. Power is, is, is the source of everything. So, so I'll, give you, I'll give you a very, clear, very simple, clear example of that. So I have terrible uh, navigating abilities. Terrible. Like he does. You you could put me. I could. Little, honest to God, I will get lost walking out of our own gym. We right almost now. went to Mexico one time. Yeah, <laughs> it's it, it's it's horrible. And so uh, we're uh, just trying to go to Chipotle. Too. So yeah, I know, right? Navigation <laughs> nice on our food. The, like, you know the new the nav on your phone. Where the hell are we going? Is brilliant for me because I don't get lost. But a couple times, and I get anxiety over. It. I get anxiety over getting lost because I always get lost. R recently, I went to a couple places and I said. You know what? I got my phone there just in case something happens. I'm going to go there and I'm going to find my way on my own. I'm going to see if I can remember. And I did. I actually got there. I actually paid attention. I got there. But the feeling I got from it was so, I felt so empowered. Yeah. Uh, I felt so good about it. Now think about that. You go on vacation. You have your phone with you. Everything's planned. You got all these emails. Yeah. What if you just shut off for a second? God, that's and then, what, that's and then a day later, you're like, wow, everything, nothing fell apart. That's, that's the great. only benefit I see of a cruise. <laughs> I mean, there's other things. Oh, I don't like a cruise, but that is one when you're out at sea. There, I mean, you can't get your stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. But then the anxiety starts building as you're getting closer to port because you're going to turn it on. Yeah, oh, exactly. yeah, right. But that's it. Goes back to our conversation about parents and kids. You remember that thing about you'll get through this. You're not going to get over it, and you're not going to. It's not going to be okay. When that kid, that youth athlete, and whatever it is in life, you make a sixty on a test, and you come back and you rock the next one. Because you figured out a plan. That is empowering. And people start realizing, wait a minute, I can control my destiny. I can influence it. And we get so caught up on the hurt and the pain versus the the build. And, you know, I, that's why I love, you know, the stories that you often see on like ESPN 360 or whatever. And they're telling these great stories because those. those are just nothing about building and, and people identifying these fears in their lives and 
And then they knock it out of the park and you're like, rock on. Yeah. Because they're human. You're cheering for them. You're yeah. cheering for them. You know, and so to me, it's almost like we should have, every business should have a whiteboard in it with our screw ups. Mm-hmm. And leave them up on the board and remember them. And that way you look at them and go. And we'll pee on them. And pee on them. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. Right. That was left field right there. Yeah. <laughs> he likes the Marcus territory. Yeah, I'm about to say yeah, it's kind like, of, yeah. you know. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So you got to look at you got to look at that and go, I know where I came from. I know where I came from. Yeah. And I know what I learned from it. But sometimes that scares the living crap out of me. Because if I see those and I've overcome them, what's around the bend? Mm-hmm. That's why you don't like getting lost. You don't like that feeling of not knowing where you are. But, you, you know, to use that Zen medicine, but there you are always there. When you found your way, you realize, okay, I'm not as bad as I think I am. Mm-hmm. And I can figure it out. I mean, what do I always do? Well, here's here's something that we're running into, uh, that we've run into now a few times. And maybe you can help us with this. Um, actually, I've been, I, I was really happy when I knew you were coming here because this was something I knew you could probably help us with. As we started, now we've all been in the industry, fitness industry, for a very long time. So this has been a long road. Uh, and when oh, people, it's not an overnight. It's not an overnight thing. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I don't believe in that. You know, yeah. it's like there was many overnights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I owned my own business for you know since the age of twenty two, and you know, Mind Pump was the first one to really make it happen in this particular industry. But it's been a culmination, culmination of all that. And the same thing, you know, I can speak for these guys. I know their history as well. But something that's happened to us is when we first started, uh, you know, this this business with this vision, we went after it um, unabashedly. And then we got some success and we found ourselves in situations and luckily they were short because we're very good at catching ourselves, but they'll, but they'll happen where instead of playing to win, we start to play to not lose Mm -hmm. like, Oh shit. All of a sudden we've got this thing. Now we can't be going to protect it. We can't be as like, as, as, uh, you know, innovative and as aggressive and we can't be our true selves as much as before. Cause that's kind of risky. Right. We got to protect what we just built. And then we catch ourselves and we like fuck that. Yeah, like we got a brand new audience that we just absorb. We can't scare them off right away with right. you know being ourselves. Ah. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's and it becomes this like battle now. I've noticed this with us is that we go through these growth spurts, and it becomes this battle of, you know, are we playing to win or are we playing to not lose? You know, it's like that boxer oh, 100%. in the ring and he's just running around because he thinks he's ahead on points. And he doesn't want to fight because God forbid he gets punched. Floyd May- Mayweather. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, you know, when you're jumping on a trampoline and you get to the very top, there's that moment of like kind of fear as you start coming back down. Like mm. you get in this weightlessness point. It's like, oh my God, it's just a momentary thing. That's what happens. You know, when I use an example, a lot of people who've climbed Mount Everest, and it's something I'll never do. I mean, I have no interest in taking 10 weeks of my life and sitting on the side of a mountain and I'm not going to do it. But they don't just climb to the top. They go up, they come back down, they go up, they come back down, they go up, they come back down, they go up, and they keep pushing to reacclimatize to the oxygenation issues and the body demands. And then they start building up that strength. Now, these are people who've been fit for nine months I climbing stairmasters. I actually didn't know that's how that works. Wow. Yeah. They, they have, have to acclimate they have to, they have to get slowly. acclimated before they can do the whole it makes climb. makes a lot Correct. of sense. No, yeah. It makes yeah. total sense. I just never even thought about that. Yeah. Wow. It's a long process. So it is. That's why it takes nine weeks. And there's a guy in Birmingham that I've interviewed on my podcast, um, Kent Stewart, who um, has climbed. He's been on the mountain four, uh, three times. Um, and he talks about that, about you know, when you first leave base camp, you have to go through the Kumba Ice Falls, which is a, an active glacier. And he's like, falls. It's like you fall if you if you make a mistake. I mean, like to your death. So every day when you leave base camp, you got to check in a moment of like, I'm going to go through one of the danger, most dangerous places ever. You go up to base camp, you know, to camp one, then you turn around and you go back down. And you keep doing that to build up the ability. Well, that's what success is. So if I'm working with an athlete, you know, we all want to be, you know, in the far right, and the same with business. I want to take over the world where well, you're not ready. You're honest. Some people do it. Some people win that lottery and they quickly figure it out. Okay. They're going to have to learn the lesson at some point. But most of us have to go and fall, go and fall, go and fall. But what we're actually doing is growing. The line is, you know, the, the regression line is definitely going up. But what's happening is when we fall a little bit, we don't fall as deep and we don't fall as far mm. and we don't actually fall for as long. And then we up, we go again. So for you guys, for me, you know, when I started, I did the exact same thing and I still do. I don't want to lose this client base. I don't want to lose this one client. And I'll sometimes work harder to keep the client than give them everything I've got because I'm afraid to lose them. But I never think in my mind, well, I could get another client. Mm -hmm. And what did I learn from that client? You know, that's often what I have to ask myself is when I'm working with this team, what did I learn about me? 
I worked with a very talented golfer on the tour who challenged me every day. And it was a challenge. And the kid is very successful. I'm very proud of his success and we have a good relationship. Um, But he challenged me. And what I realized is never sacrifice what I believe because, you know, he was very good at finding the areas that you lacked your most confidence. Mm -hmm. So he was very good at it. And it was just, it was a way he adapted is he would push you until he found an area where you weren't as confident and then he'd kind of attack. So what I found is if I'm on the defense, he'll find it every time. But if I'm giving him everything I got, if it's not good enough, so be it. And I learned a lesson. And I remember sitting down with my wife who runs my business. She's like, look, you have got to give them what they're hiring you for. And if it's good enough, it is. If it's what they want, wonderful. If it's not, they'll go somewhere else. Same thing with you guys. You don't have to win everybody in this marketplace. Right. Mm. Because, and I, and I get caught up on that. I mean, I, I, last yesterday, actually, I was hitting social media. And I, I, for some reason, tend to be a source of some subtweeting. Um, <laughs> and it pisses me off. I mean, it like hurts because these people, one, don't know me. They don't ask my questions. And I say what I believe, but I'm also not – I also have this underneath. I'm just a soft kitty. Um, <laughs> the fact is I, I – yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I want people to like me. Okay, I want to be accepted. I mean, that's what we all want. And when I see it, it upsets me. And then I see certain folks in this field kind of grouping together, and I'm like, why am I not asked to do that? Right. You know, I've got unbelievable credibility. I think I do a good job. I've got – Tons of, of elite athletes, but I don't share who I work with, so nobody knows. I don't go out there and say, I walked by this guy in a gym, and now I'm his, his mental coach. That happens a lot. Um, and so to me, I, I, I start lacking my confidence. Hmm. And it hurts because I sit there and I'm like, what the hell am I doing wrong? But then I sit back and I go, wait a minute here. I'm doing damn good work, and it doesn't matter what they think. What matters is what the, my clients think, and what matters is what my wife thinks, and what, hap- what matters is my two daughters think. And most importantly, who matters the most is the man in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And I can't lie to myself in the mirror. And if I look back and say, have I done everything I possibly can? Back to that earlier question. Probably not. Or have I? Yeah, I have. If, If I can sit there laying on the ground, beaten up, but at least I know I gave everything, I can live with that. And that insecurity, that's what we have to... So I'm trying in every day of my life to figure out how to do that better. We'll push... Well, that's what you guys are doing. Mm-hmm. Well, and the, I had that experience uh, a long time ago managing um, large teams and, and health clubs, where you know I think everybody wants to be liked, right? Yeah. Nobody doesn't want nobody so, wants to be disliked. Well, and I and I ask myself like why why do I want to be liked uh, by all these people? Um, and I really dove deep into that, and I realized that if I'm not being my true self because I'm trying to get someone to really like me, then they're not really liking me anyway. Well, that's the mask. They like the mask. Right. So to me, um, there are, and I wrote this in the book, there are three drives in every human. The need for accomplishment, the need for social acceptance, and the need for stability. Okay? So we're driving. If you really look at your life, those are the three drives besides sex, food, and shelter. Let's take mm-hmm. those out. Um, we all want accomplishment. You guys are doing this because you want to build something. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I would think it, you, your vision, I know of talking to you and seeing it, I get it. You want to accom- you want to make a dent in this industry. You want to provide a service that there's a gap. You want to be, you want to sit back at some point when somebody comes in and buys you out probably and go, damn guys, we did good. We accomplished this. But you know what will happen, right? That clock will tick. That clock will tick. And then you'll go. You want to do something else? Mm, yeah. Because yeah. once you do it once, it's not enough. Yeah, my girl yeah. reminds me every day. I know. She, 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 I always tell her, honey, we're right there. We're almost there. Honey, yeah. we're almost there. She yeah. just like, until, until she just, what? She just yeah. laughs at me. Yeah. <laughs> we all want social acceptance. <clears throat> That's what social media is about. Mm. The power of a like actually is unbelievable. Oh, it's ridiculous. It, I, the, the, one of the biggest fears, I think one of the top dopamine three yeah. biggest yeah. fears of, of, of all people is public speaking. Mm-hmm. The most, one of the safest things you could possibly, not going to get killed, but it's the yeah. number one fear for most people is to get up and speak well, in front of people. it's being rejected by, you know, mass people, people you value. It's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, and that's why we want it's acceptance. Rejection. Yeah. We're social creatures. If you want to break a human, isolate them. Mm. That's what we see in bullying, and that's mm. what we see in shunning. In fact, isn't that considered yeah. like a cruel, uh, an unusual punishment? That oh, absolutely. Can, can mention bandit. Oh, yeah, 100%. And so when you look at like what we do with violent offenders in prison, they put them in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day, and then they wonder why they're violent. Right. Yeah. I'd go crazy. They get an hour outside in the sun. If not, they're just communicating with people that they're picking at all day long. Mm. 
And the last one is stability. We function extraordinarily well in chaos as people. And we're always trying to find our stable, our stable pathway. But we want, st- we want predictability. You want to know, I and mean, we want to know what are you guys going to make in October? Mm-hmm. What are you going to make in January? I don't want surprises. But yet, why when we first see chaos, we go, oh my God, we actually go, okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. I found my pathway through, which is stable. So that social acceptance is critically important. And that's why, you, I mean, you guys don't want to be the maverick, you know, jerks of the industry. That's not what, that's not what your message is. Your message is bringing, you said it very clearly, finding great people who have great content who don't know how to do it. And you're going to bring that to them. Some people choose to be the a-hole. They want to be the antagonist. They want to be the guy that knocks down everybody else. And through that, they create a little social acceptance because they create a, a standing. Right. But, you know, I look at you guys and I go, this is, I mean, you've got to have some social acceptance. But well, what do you do? Eventually, you're going to start saying, well, I want acceptance from these people. I mean, my fans are great, but I want to be accepted by, mm. you know, X, Y, Z in the industry. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. We, I mean, more than anything, what drives us more than almost, and of course, we're all entrepreneurs. We're businessmen. Um, we, we like success. We like accomplishment. Um, we like challenge. We definitely crave challenge. But really, you know, the things that we share behind the scenes where we, you know, we'll send these messages to each other is when we see the impact that's made on everyday people. Like we'll get messages from, you know, God, you know, I used to beat myself up. I used to starve myself or I used to eat this particular way or I used to not, I used to have this horrible body image issue or, and you guys really changed like my life. Like I'm, I'm, I'm accepting of myself. My, my relationship to food has changed now because, you know, I love, I do because I love my body, not because I hate my body. Like these are the, these are the, these are the stories that when we hear, it makes me feel, it makes us feel very, very good and passionate okay. about what we're doing. So let me ask you this question for the three of you. When you get those messages and you share them, you all sit back in your chair for a minute and there's a, there's a glow. Mm-hmm. What comes next? Oh, more, more passion and yeah. Yeah, drive. Yeah. Let's go again. Yeah. And that's why it's so important. I mean, that, that's what drives you guys, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's, it's making an impact one person at a time. One person at a time becomes your tribe. Your tribe becomes your mass. Your mass becomes your, your raving fans. Um, so that's also why one critique hurts. Oh, yeah. I remember we all got our first yeah. one. We all had our... What, <laughs> was, it? what uh, was it? Somebody somebody left a review. So we have this over... Was a, this was early days, yeah, too. Yeah, very, very, really messed with you a little bit. Did. Yeah, you it mentioned did. this on air, which was it's, it's, awkward. When we, when we first started, it was awkward. <laughs> no, it was good, though, dude. <laughs> it was good that he did. Yeah. Well, no, I, I I admitted that it, yeah. it, it hurt my feelings. I said, hey, you know, this was... Uh, so, and, and I knew when we first started off... Um, you know, I kind of play the the antagonist out of the three of us. I tend to pro- poke and prod and and say the shit that's off off wall off the wall a lot. So I come off as the guy who can kind of be the asshole, right? And I'm okay with that 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 role in this the three of our personalities. And I actually had somebody who like like they wrote a long old review and it was like complimenting the actual show but then it like singled me out of like not liking me i think the part that was hard about that was like they didn't just hate they, they said you know sal's great justin's great i don't like adam yeah and that was really for for him yeah. it was really, really tough. yeah because it wasn't like they were attacking the show or what we do or what like that i'm okay with that it was like a, it was a personal attack on my personality and it was really i, I can't remember the exact things so we've had over a thousand reviews right and literally out of the thousand i think we have 990 like seven that are five star and then this was like this one like not five star review and they they wrote this and said that and i and i had to like whoa i was like wow i can't believe that that hurt my feelings like that i allowed that to and so i felt and that's something about that uh, this show that we try and stay very real and raw and be as transparent as possible and i said man that wow that hurt my feelings it hurt my feelings that somebody who doesn't even really know me because they've heard some episodes and you know i talk a certain way or i didn't you know they they like my other two co-hosts not me and it actually hurt my feelings so that was a major uh growth did you change um no i didn't change who i was what i, I mean because you have you have thousands of and one hurts yes mm. isn't that crazy <sighs> I get it, hundred percent. It's cra- it's crazy, right? It, 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 and I would, if you would have told me that that was going to happen before, I would be like, no big deal. I would, I would tell you that I wouldn't think it'd be a deal. When it actually happened, I was like, whoa, that actually got me a little bit. That mm-hmm. actually, it bothered me because they took a, they attacked my character, 
And I and I think that was that's my pride and my ego getting in the way that I I, I want people to know that man I'm a really a good guy actually I got I got I care a lot about people I do a lot of good things for people so for someone to attack my character like that it really hurt my feelings so I had to but it was good that it happened early on you didn't go to your safe space or anything did you <laughs> no no <laughs> yeah. no no safe space we gave him a furry we stuffed animal, animal. Yeah. furry yeah. stuffed animal and crowns yeah. Yeah. but yeah. it was it, it was I didn't, you said something that uh, I love that um, and I don't know God, I forget where I read this but you know being uh, being comfortable with being uncomfortable and I really seek out those moments because like you said those are those are your moments of growth like in if you're I always like to look at every state change so we've been talking a lot about like negative stuff but even positive like I'll evaluate why I got really excited about something or why I got really happy or joyful or laughed about something that was any sort of state change and then of course if there was something that made me feel a certain way and instead of like oh angry at this person instantly I think back like, whoa, why did that bother me? Why did I allow that? So before we went on the air, you were talking about, and I was checking my phone, so I kind of heard what you're talking about, but the fish that grows to the size of the bowl, right? Yeah. So it's what I call the goldfish effect. So we, the human mind is very much like a goldfish bowl. You buy a goldfish at Walmart or whatever, you put it in a five-gallon fish bowl, it ain't going to grow out of it. It's never going to jump out. It's not going to hit the side. It doesn't even hit the side of the thing. It just goes, feed me, and it comes up, it feeds. But it regulates its growth based on the size of its environment. You put it in a bigger bowl, it does the same thing. And I always joke that if you put it in a pond outside of a Japanese restaurant, it becomes a koi fish. There's some of me, I'm sure, on your podcast or mine is going to sit there and say, okay, now, theoretically, and truthfully, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an analogy, people. Get over it. Yeah. Okay, But it grows <laughs> to larger fish. Our minds do the same thing. If all we think is we could be is this big, that's all you're going to be. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to come pluck you out of the thing and say, look, you don't believe you should be a starter or you don't believe you should be on the main stage. We want you to do it because it's like you never bought the lottery ticket. Right. Mm-hmm. And that goldfish bowl. So we have to shatter our fish bowls yeah. and get out of our comfort zones because what we actually do is what we define as our comfort zone is actually one step inside of it. Right. Because we never, it's like the dog that's got the electric fence. It's not going to go find the barrier after it's been shocked a few times. That's natural in- inclinations. We're going to keep resisting. And I find myself doing it too. You know, you get a bad review or a coach, you know, I work with is like, yeah, I'm not digging Brett. It doesn't work. I don't, uh, and I, I'm like, I ruminate on it. Mm-hmm. I can't let go of it because I'm a people pleaser. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it hurts that I've let somebody down. I, I go back and say, did I give them everything I had? Yeah, I did. You know, I mean, I've given talks where sometimes, you know, you get moving fast and you say something and you're like, Ooh, oops. Didn't mean to say that. And <laughs> and it's like, oh, God, I hope they don't misunderstand what I'm saying or hope I didn't offend anybody, but I do it with passion. Um, and that fishbowl, that fishbowl is so damn comfortable. Right. You know, it's, uh, I think we forget that we, as humans, we, we are driven by some of these similar primitive instincts that we see in, in other animals. Ours are just far more complex, but like, uh, like circuses when they would have uh, elephants. Oh, the elephant! I was yeah thinking of that. People don't. I mean, people don't know this, but one of the ways they would train an elephant is when they're young, is they would chain them up with heavy chains. Right. So, and this elephant would fight and fight and fight to free itself. And over time, you, and you'll see this if you ever look at these. Like you don't have any of these uh, circuses here in America, but these third world countries will have them. You see these massive elements, elephants, and they're tied down around one ankle. On the skinny rope, and you and you think to yourself like that elephant could break that rope mm-hmm. at any moment. At any but time, yeah. it has now been it's a, it's a limit it's a within condition. Yeah, it's a limit within its own within its own mind, um, and this happens to us uh, as humans as well. Yeah. Far more complex, but when you realize that the the size of your mind or your consciousness or whatever you whatever term you want to use, if it's the size of a walnut. Then, then everything is that size. Your understanding of the world is the size of a walnut. Your relationships can only reach the capacity of that of that walnut. Your your understanding of yourself, your business, it's all that same size. You can never go outside of that until you take that the size of your mind or your consciousness or your understanding and grow it to the size of an orange and then the size of a watermelon, the size of whatever. The larger it gets, the more you expand and grow upon it, the more your understanding of everyday things. I find this with myself, like. My understanding of things that I thought I understood, the things that I thought I knew, uh, my understanding of exercise and fitness, very simple things that I've been doing for, for decades, grows and expands as I expand my mind's own capacity. But the only way, the only way you will grow is through being uncomfortable and painful. It is literally tied together. It does not happen from being comfortable. You cannot 
go, I'll use a, a gym analogy again because we're a fitness podcast, right? I am not going to develop bigger biceps if I use the same weight and do the same exercises all the time. At some point, it will stop. I have to introduce a new pain to it or make it a little bit uncomfortable to cause it to grow. Is, now, that, th- is that because it accommodates? Is that what it does? It just... You adapt. adapt. Adaptation yeah, process. Adaptation. Mm-hmm. Okay. You just, Which is just like everything else in the body when you think about how we adapt to anything. Your, yeah. mind, your yeah. mind is the same thing. It just adapts. Yeah, 100%. It eventually just adapts to, uh, to and, and, and stresses. In, de- in depression, we call that learned helplessness. Mm. So a, um, a very powerful psychologist by the name of Martin Seligman had done some research and he was studying dogs. And if you put dogs in a, a shock box and the floor has a shocker in it, and if a light comes on, there's so there's two shockers. They're side by side in this box. There's two lights. If the red light comes on, the left one shocks. Dogs figure it out pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Oh, crap. Red light. Get to the other side. The blue light comes on. That side shocks. They see the blue light. They run to the other side. But if you make it inconsistent, red light comes on, right one shocks. Blue one comes on. They both shock. The dog just lays down. It stops fighting and it just, it just says- just gives up. It gives up. Oh, wow. And it just says- pretty much world, I don't know what's coming at me and I'm just learning to be helpless. Hmm. Okay. Versus, see, our environment is inconsistent to us. That's what creates the fear. The inconsistent, the unknown. We don't know what tomorrow is going to be. There could be a terrorist attack tonight that changes our lives. There could be, God forbid, we meet somebody at Starbucks that changes our life. It could be that you know, some conversation we have changes our life. Never know. Never know what the next phone calls will be. And that doesn't mean for us to live scared. I don't know what the weather's going to be tomorrow. You know, it's funny you say that. I just thought of it. So I go to a gym and work out uh, on my own. Um, and I go in there and I use a locker. And all the lockers, by the way, are open for everybody. Mm-hmm. And I use the same fucking locker every time. Every time. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. And it's like, you ever, you know, college campuses? <laughs> yeah. You, go look on college campuses. Pick your pick your desk. You can sit wherever you want. All semester, you sit in the same desk. Same yeah. desk. <laughs> Unless there's a hot chick that you want to <laughs> follow around. Yeah, yeah. follow around. It, yeah. This is, it, it is. When, before I was married, honey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is our, and, and you got to understand, this is the interesting thing now. Our, our mind um, it has the ability to evolve far faster than some of our instincts. This is why you have this awareness, you know, uh, revolution yep. that happens, you know, throughout the throughout the decades where people change the way they think. But there, but there's there's still these these primitive instincts that that we evolved to have because of the environment that we mm-hmm. used to live in. None of us live in the environment that you know that you know our, our ten generations back evolved in where. It was a good thing to have everything be predictable, to know exactly where to go. The lion's going to be over there. I'm going to be over here. This is my cave. Stay inside when it's dark. Like That kept us alive. But today, you know, the risks aren't nearly the same. And uh, staying, trying to be safe all the time will severely limit you. Well, and that's why anxiety is spiking. Hmm. Because we're like, we're, what we're doing is we're like those dogs. That actually, that dog studies kind of defines a level of depression. But anxiety and depression run together 80% of the time. So... When people have anxiety, they're they're unsure about the upcoming future. In other words, they're walking outside to check the weather and yelling at the clouds versus saying, go get my umbrella. Mm. What I want that dog to do is to bear down and get ready. When the shock comes, it's ready. It's got it. Okay, I can survive it. Mm. That shock, I know how strong it's going to be. I know what it's going to be. I know I can survive it every time. The reason anxiety comes in is that the predictability of the old days of, okay, I don't know where the lion is. I don't know where the bear is, but I know that's its den. It's probably going to stay somewhat nearby. Mm-hmm. And I know it's going to get dark at 5.30 and at night I'm going to, you know, have a, I'm going to eat around the campfire and then I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to start the process again tomorrow. We don't have that predictability anymore because we've created such technological advances in sports. We've, we've got such talented people we're competing against that the unpredictability is an all time high. And as a result, we feel so powerless. And as a result, we have anxiety. Anxiety is spiking among college athletes. It's unbelievable the number, the amount of anxiety that we're seeing across college campuses. Really, unbelievable. Hmm. And we used to think that is interesting. We used to think and it's that. crazy because, I mean, let's be honest now, right? Uh, if we went, what do we, you know, twenty seventeen? Go back a hundred years. Let's go back a hundred years. Life was way fucking harder. Yeah, you actually had a lot more shit like you to be stressed about and anxious yeah. over. 100%. You could literally, now. you could literally get an infection and die. Correct. And it happened a lot. If you got pregnant, uh, there's a good chance you're going to die in childbirth. Right. It, you're probably going to be malnourished. Uh, if you lost your job, you might starve. This was a hundred years ago. It's not that long ago. Yeah. 
Uh, today, okay, none Did, of that shit's gonna happen. My God, fifteen years ago, you had to go to a travel agent to get a, a airline ticket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, twenty years ago. So to your point, but we didn't know what we didn't know back then. Mm. That's right. Yeah. So right now, on our phone, we could get an alert that says bus bombed in Lebanon, and we <laughs> go, "Oh my God, I feel terrible for those people." See the pictures. Of it, you yeah. see the picture, and we connect to them. In the old days, it took forty-eight hours for us to get that news. Right. If we were looking for it, it yeah. wasn't in your face. Yeah. All and then it was in a newspaper the next day. Exactly. <laughs> so the unpredictability is what's killing us, but it's not the unpredictability. I had a, in, in Alabama this summer, we had about, I think it was like 90 something days without rain. And for us, that's a lot. We just this bubble over this area that just, we got into a major drought. And it was in the fall by the time it started raining. So I was working with an athlete one day and she was from a foreign country. And we were talking about perception and, and identifying what the environment is. And I said, if you walk, it was pouring down rain. First day it had rained in the entire, I mean, quarter, half a year. And I said, if you walked outside right now, what would you think the climate is of this city? And she essentially described Seattle, hmm. right? The perception of Seattle, you know, wet, rainy, cold. And I said, but we've had 93 days of sun. So when you allow your environment to dictate your perception, your only, and your emotion to dictate your perception, then that's where we're lost. And so I want people to look at the unpredictability of life and go, you know what? I got it. Mm. I don't know what it's going to bring, but I've I've risen up to every challenge and I've always found a way. That's that stubbornness. That's that vision. That's everything. You know, they did studies. Uh, you remember the movie Jaws when oh, yeah. that came out? Um, and they did. Saw that at a drive-in theater. Yeah. Great, great <laughs> movie. And they did studies on people and their perception of the dangers of swimming in the water uh, exploded. Mm-hmm. People thought shark attacks were happening all over yeah. the place. And I feel the reality, that way about Sharknado too. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, and the reality is, shark attacks are pretty consistent all year all year long, and it's extremely rare. Rare, yeah. And now that we have social media, now that we have all this technology, it amplifies the the, the perceived threat of all this crazy okay. shit that's happening. Right. So, what's y'all's fears? What's mm. your biggest fear? Jeez. Well, now that I have kids, I mean, anything that has to do with the safety of my children. Okay. By mm. far. Okay. We'll we'll fear. take that as a given. Mm-hmm. We'll take that as a given. Okay. Now, in business, in life, your perception, what's your mm. biggest fear? Stability, for sure. Hmm. Describe for sure. that. What is that? Uh, to to not know what, uh, to not have an income the next month, you know, to not be, have enough money to pay your bills and to put food on your table. That's probably the, and to be honest with you, which is ironic because that's, you know, I've you been, haven't been honest with me yet. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when people say that too. I just God caught, my, caught myself yeah. doing that. You call me out that you get. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I grew up some, and I know. So this is, you know, go to diving in deeper, right? So I know that's my insecurity, right? And I know that's driven from my childhood because I grew up poor, but yet, you know, I by nineteen years old, you know, I was already, at, I was only making fifty grand, but back at nineteen years old, that was a lot of money, and then had bought my house by the time I was 21 years old. So for sure, I know where, where it stems from, but it's crazy how we allow something like that, this, oh, like I'm not going to get paid, this instability, when in reality, I'm probably just fine. I'll always be just fine. But yet that drive that drives me, and that is some fear or the anxiety that I would I deal with. Yeah, yeah but, but, why not, have- but why not for you, though, growing up poor, and look where you are now, why not look at that differently and go, I grew up poor. I don't want to go back there, but I'm okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, think about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's what I have to do. When you said that, like, if I'm being honest with myself, that's part of what drives me and motivates me. So I, I guess this is a good question for you then. When you know that something like that, I'm right, just... something like that is also uh, a major motivator, right? That's a part of, I, I, I have to know that that's a part of my success was also driven from my initial fear. And the evolution of that is to no longer be afraid of that to in, and to embrace it, to be okay with it, to accept that I'm not going to not be able to pay the bills. I'm not going to not have food. That's never been a problem. But then also to be okay with that and use that to propel me. Like where is the fine line and the balance in that of having something that is stemmed from childhood that you've now grown, you've now you're now aware of. How do you embrace it and how do you use it so that it's not something that holds you back, but it's also something that you can continue to use to help fuel you? Yeah, it's being able to look at look at look at it, right, and understand it. Right. See, when when you say poor, what do you hear? What do you think? Well, 
food stamps, you know, being evicted from a house like that. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's poor to me. But we celebrate that in entrepreneurs. Right. I mean, there are sales trainers like I've been, I've had my electricity turned off seven times. Right. Mm. Right. It's true. It's very true. And so to me, I look at that and I go, would you be as hungry today if you grew up on a trust fund? No, definitely not. Mm. That's what I'm saying though. That's, I know that like I, like I'm definitely not somebody who's like, I'm the last one to say, poor me feel bad for what I, how I grew up. It's like, I, I, I wouldn't change anything. I really wouldn't. And I had, I, I had a hell of a childhood growing up and I know that that also built okay, a so, lot of, a so lot does of character. what drive you the desire to not be poor or does the desire to be rich? Probably the desire to be rich. If I'm okay. honest with myself, if I look, if I go back to diving into, you know, uh, you know, go back, go back, go back, go back. Th- I remember being a child, you know, and I remember hanging out with friends and going to their house and, you know, they had, they had, you know, mom always had all like desserts on the counter and candy jars and we were watching pay-per-view TV and we were going to Giants baseball. I could do all these cool things. And then at my house, I didn't have any of that stuff. Mm. And so really, I, I, as a kid, I desired that. I wanted that for myself. And then I also had parents that talk down upon people that had lots of money. Like that was a bad thing. Mm-hmm. So that was like a, this struggle as a child going through that, them telling you that, oh, money doesn't matter. All you need to love, 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 loves what drives happiness and money is the root of all evilness and people that have it are all evil yeah. and bad. And I'm going in my head, I'm scratching my head as a kid going, well, th- these people don't seem Yeah, evil. they seem like yeah. they're doing they all right. Like, they seem I have a similar happy. situation too, yeah. like growing up like with money being looked at differently. It, it was it was something like they are the ones that have it, you know, but what we have is is more impactful. It's love, it's it's mm. this, it's that. And so I had that that idea of like the the success of, you know, financial success as being a negative thing. And also for me like one of the biggest I guess fears, you know, going into, you know, more success minded and, uh, you know, achieving new platforms is, is all the eyes and, and the eyes, uh, uh, grow. And, and, and that, that's what kind of gives me anxiety because growing up and, and kind of doing my thing, I always just wanted to do my own thing. And I didn't. But why, why'd you want to do your own thing? Because I wanted to make myself. I was just interested in, I, I wasn't trying to show off to everybody else. I wanted to make myself feel good and and to to do that for just myself and i feel like uh for me it's it's really hard to i know you know what it is it's avoiding criticism that's what it was so g- growing up i i just tried to avoid criticism by just keeping everything internally to to myself so you're my a pleaser you, you didn't want conflict right right so now it's at at, at a stage where so he he was cr- adam was crushed you were crushed by the that critique. Yeah. Mm. Why does that happen to you? Because I've probably haven't put all of my entire self out there on display. Yeah. Right. And, and I have, and I've been working on that, but it's been hard. So for me, I went through a, a, a transformational kind of a change, a challenge in the very beginning. And not only that, I didn't speak a lot. And so that was a safety thing for me. Yeah. You know, so I, I would pull back out of the conversation. And you'd go for safety. You would, mm-hmm. you'd be that reporter that, or that commentator who would just kind of take the middle line. Right. There's not a lot of things to- The filler. The filler, yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I, and, that, and I kind of found a role in that as far as the team dynamic is concerned. Does, does that tick you off? Um, sometimes. Sometimes I feel like uh, it, 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 the, the subject matter, it moves quickly. And, and there's a lot of words. Um, a lot of the subject matter is already covered. And so, therefore, I, didn't, I wasn't able to get in my opinion. Yeah. So, I bet you envy the quick-witted mm. when you listen to things. When yeah. you watch things. Well, I, well see, you're attracted to people. I was very attracted. Right? Yeah. So, like your Stephen Colbert, yeah. like, like your stand-up comedians, like those are people I always idolized. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And we tend to idolize the people that were the opposite of us. Like we always see other people's strengths mm-hmm. and what those strengths are, are our weaknesses. Mm. Mm, if you if you really look at what other people, you go, I love what that person does. Mm-hmm. It's because I can't. Like I, I was, I've ever since I was a kid, I've worn orthotics, and I'm not flat footed. I'm what's called deformed flat footed. So I'm my I even I crash in even more. Mm. My dad was in the Air Force when I was diagnosed with it. We were living in the Philippines, so. In today's world, they probably would put me through physical therapy, and I probably would have strengthened that. Mm. But, but I've never been a runner. I can't run. All right, 
And when I was a baseball player, we had to go run five miles. And I mean, it was like watching an elephant run. I mean, it was just, you know, <laughs> you know, going down the road. But whenever I see somebody running on the road, I see freedom. I'll never feel that. I, I don't know what it's like to run and open it up. You know, those guys that are running and they got their, they've got this just sculpted body and they just look, they just look awesome running down the side. I'll never get that. Looks effortless. It looks effortless. <laughs> and so I idolize that. So I actually think that is the ideal of being fit. Because I can't do it, I reject it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then I resent it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, when I said when I started this industry and and took my psychology and said, okay, I'm gonna work with athletes on performances, I said, well, most of the people in the field are skinny, they're fit, they're tanned with great teeth and great hair, and I ain't got none of that. <laughs> so I just gotta have good content. But that's that's a self fulfilling. That's a joke that's made to kind of soften it on me. That you know, I'm I don't, I don't like. I, I trained for a living. You know, when I was in college, I don't like to work out. Mm. I don't like it. I like to eat. I like to eat the bad stuff. <laughs> okay, so to that, it's like sometimes we resent that. And the problem is, you have a lot to offer. And I'm not sitting here doing therapy, but you have a lot to offer. Mm-hmm. And the fact is, we we ruminate on the things that we don't like. Like to me, damn, you grew up poor. You survived, mm-hmm. but my I I see with like my mom and my father in law, both grew up dirt ass poor, you know, like outhouses poor, and my father in law won't eat chicken today because that's all they ate, that's all they could afford. They had a chicken yeah. house. My mom grew up in an environment where she didn't get along with her parents; they rejected her. She was a model. She's a twin sister. Twin sister. They're beautiful. Looking at the pictures, I'm like, damn, my mom was hot, and they rejected her. And they would make comments like, "The other sisters are prettier." Mm. I'm like, what parent says that? But you have to understand when they react in a certain way, like my father-in-law sold his business. All he wanted was to get to a spot that he'd never live poor again. He didn't care how much money he actually made. Mm. My mom just wants a family. And so when she would get upset about something, I'd have to remember why. It's because she didn't like her family. And we always are drawn to the opposite. I mean, what's your biggest fear? You had time to think about it. Now you got something really succinct. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. It better be better than ours. Yeah, of course. He'll he'll deliver it so much better. (laughs) He'll find a way to make his fears make him sound hella good right here. Just watch. You ready? Spiders. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say that. No, you know... um, I'm not afraid of uh, of being poor. I feel very confident in my ability to to earn a living if I had to. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I don't have shared the same fear with Justin in the sense of I I, I I talk and I talk a lot and I have no problem speaking my mind. In fact, uh, I probably speak my mind too much. I, I you know I was thinking about you, you know what's a real fear for myself and I think it actually I know it has a lot to do with I don't want to be. I don't want to be a fraud, and what I mean by that is, mm. uh, I've led lots of uh, lots of teams. I've managed gyms with lo- large teams, and I've had people work for me, and they themselves have grown and become successful. And I helped coach them through that process. And I have younger siblings. I'm the oldest of four, and when they go through tough times, they call me to ask me advice, and I give them advice on what they need to do and how they need to succeed. And I, I don't want to fail because I don't want to be a fraud. I don't want to realize that my beliefs in what it takes to succeed and what it takes to do well is bullshit. It doesn't work. It's not working for me. Like what's going on? Um, so that that's one of my fears. I don't. I don't. I guess I fear failure, but more than that, I fear that this identity that I that I believe is mine um, is not doesn't work. Isn't real. Mm. Like maybe I maybe I don't succeed because everything I believed in was wrong. That's a very scary thing for me. Yeah, I, can, I, I see it. It's what we call imposter syndrome, and you see it with I, I see you see it with physicians a lot, and that's why they put up an image. But mm. the best people are insecure. You, know, you don't want a physician who knows it all. Hmm. You want a physician who knows what they don't know, hmm. right? right? I'm intelligent because I know that I know nothing. Yeah, I, I'm intelligent because I know I need to ask for help, right? And if you look at the three different fears, now you know what drives y'all, but you also know what keeps you up at night. Mm-hmm. And and I, I and I recognize all three of them. I didn't grow up poor; I grew up upper middle class. Um, so I don't. But there was a time in our life where my dad lost his job. He was after he left the Air Force, and you know I remember I was a sophomore in high school. He lost his job, and even though he was a pharmacist, he could find a job, but it was hard because he had a really good job. And and I remember that pain of 
of family financial problems. And I never want my kids to ever know about the finances in the house <clears throat> ever, ever. Um, my parents didn't do anything wrong there, but I, that, that got me. Mm-hmm. I recognize deeply with the imposter syndrome. Um, I feel that one a lot because I, I want people to connect and, and what I do, you live and die a little bit by the success of your athletes, but you sometimes have to remember that they don't always succeed and your job is to guide them through that. But what happens if what I'm giving them is crap? Yeah. That's scary. And and I get it. And then the same thing with you about I'm the same way. I don't want to say something that crosses. Like I told you, being subtweeted about something I said, it hurt. I mean, it bothers me. Mm-hmm. Like I just want to go on blast, but I refuse to do it. I just want to blast these people. But, you know, fear guides us. Absolutely. Unfortunately. And I don't think enough people really are honest with what what their fear is. That's, I think that's that that mask. Well, you, actually wear I, the I think mask you just got you got to be okay with it. You, I think only, that's that's the first step. It's just you, I think you got to realize like you're you might not be open to really looking at it because you're so fucking scared of it. Hundred percent. Like, what's I mean? You know, you ever the, watch? Remember your kid? You watch a scary movie and there'll be like a scary face. Yeah, and you turn your face. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to look at it. Correct. Because it's scary. It. Yeah. You just don't want to look at okay, it. Okay. How about this? I'll give you one more. My daughters are 20 and 16, but when, you know, they lay in bed at night and they say, there's something under my bed. Well, they don't get out of the bed to look at it, do they? They actually think there's something under the bed. They make it into something much larger Mm -hmm. and it becomes a monster that they saw on that TV show. Mm -hmm. And now it's real. I mean, I'm telling you, it's real. And you go flip on the light and it's their underwear they didn't pick up last night Mm. that's laying on the bed. They misinterpreted those. Fear is the bully on the playground. It does not get dealt with until it gets faced Mm -hmm. when you refuse to face it it just continues to grow and it becomes the baddest son of a bitch up there but like any bully on the playground they are the most insecure human beings there is yep so we see their their bark but we realize they have no bite but we don't know that until we do it and that means we got to step out of our comfort zone we got to break our fishbowl to get after it and punch him in the face. And punch him in the face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fuck you, bully. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And it's fun. I mean, it's it's you know, I, like I said, I'm fascinated by seeing this because I know there's a vulnerability that comes with doing what y'all are doing. I mean, I look at the room. There's, I mean, how many of it? There's five of y'all sitting here. Mm-hmm. Did I add that right? I went to LSU. Um, <laughs> so there's five. There's five lives. There's more lives behind it, depending on it. Mm-hmm. Which one are we going to be motivated by? These five lies are the millions of people out there that need your message. Mm. If you take care of those millions of people out there that need these messages, these five prosper. Right. Mm-hmm. If you worry about these five, they suffer. You know, it's uh, it's like when you go when you're a kid and you go to the doctor. Do we need to light a candle. And I just yeah. I said we just went deep. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's good. Dude, We're gonna I hug like, after I like, this. I, I like this. It's good because it's. Uh, I, I know it's helping me. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, again, I talk a lot about li- liking to speak to people. I enjoy speaking to crowds, but I'm also terrified hmm. about it. Like when we go speak in live and we have people in front of us, I'm terrified before we go do it. You, Usually, you imagine me, dude. Yeah, it yeah. takes it takes like ten minutes, fifteen, twenty minutes sometimes for me to get into my flow. Mm-hmm. Because of that fear of what? You know what? You're saying that. I, I found I'm doing the same thing. I love I, I When I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, I probably gave 100 talks a year. But it was on their content. And I could take their content and make it great. I liked, I'm narcissistic enough that I like being in front of, in front of people. But what I'm finding now is like coming up here and I had to do a couple talks earlier in the week and, and whatever. And uh, you know, I reached out to people and, and I find myself, I'm starting to get cranky on the days I have to give talks. Hmm. Yesterday I did a full day clinic up at the Olympic club and I was cranky in the morning and it's not cranky that I know I can't do it, but it's what is going to happen. And I start worrying and I find myself, I get, it's like last night when I got back to my room, I felt so relieved because this wasn't anxiety provoking for me at all. This was, I couldn't wait for mm-hmm. because this is going to be us just hanging around, having a conversation. There's going to be no judgment. I mean, What's the worst is I leave here and you go, that was sucks and don't don't run that podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. There's nothing to lose. But you stand in front of an audience and you look out there and I don't know if you have this thought, and all of a sudden somebody's like doing that on you. Yeah. Or get up and leave. Get up and leave. And you're like, yeah. you. Yeah. 
And you change your entire talk to that person that's not paying attention. Mm-hmm. Right. But right next to that person, there's somebody who is just really cares, just eating it, up. it yeah. Yeah. and living it. And I've do- I find myself doing that. I get cranky and I try to find the person who makes me uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And I end up tailoring to them and I'm missing. I'm, that's my fault. That crankiness. And at the same time, I go, wait a minute here. What happens if I... I've heard great people... I've heard musicians say, I play to one person in the audience. I make contact to that person. I try to change their life. Mm-hmm. And like, well, you're playing in front of 30,000 people. It doesn't matter. That one person matters. And I'm like, okay, I get it. Mm-hmm. I get it. And I guess that's what actors do. I mean, they become so invested in their one character to that person they're interacting with. But I get you, man. I, so I, I mean, I'm there. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that's that's helped me is recently is I've, I've identified the physical feelings of anxiety and that the way I interpret those physical feelings can determine whether yes. or not it's anxiety or excitement. Okay, let's go there. Can we? Yeah, absolutely. What are the feelings of anxiety? It's the same as excitement. Damn right. Exact same. Okay. Yeah, you know, elevated heart rate, yes. sweat palms, you feel tight in the chest, you got... You gotta you know, take a leak. You gotta go to the bathroom. Yeah, it's all. It's all. That's exactly what happens when you fall in love. By the way, it's the same right fucking now. feeling. Yeah, you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what the difference is is our interpretation. Mm-hmm. So for me, the way I look at emotion is it starts with a stimuli, or it starts with stimuli. Not you know, not a stimulus. It starts with stimuli. Stimulus. Stimuli gets perceived. Okay. That perception is guided by our past, our future, all those thoughts, that, you know, our, our judgments, our stereotypes, all that stuff. That creates a feeling in the body. That feeling in the body becomes perceived. That perception becomes evaluated, which becomes an emotion. So if we feel this way, our mind has a, has a radar system in it. It's checking the environment. So when we go, it's anxiety. Oh, God, this feels uncomfortable. The mind goes, why is it uncomfortable? Why? What's wrong? What's going on out there? And it sends out the scouts and goes, Find what's wrong. And it goes, you know what's wrong? Dude, I don't think I know my, my talk very well. And so-and-so is going to be in that audience. And, oh, God, I don't know if I know it. And then it starts recruiting. Fear is like that friend you invite to a party that you know. It's like if I invited you to a party and um, you know, I'm like, come on, but I know you're going to bring 10 guys that I don't like. That's what fear is. I can deal with you, but it's the next 10 that I can't stand. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is that feeling in the body, which is, which is neutral, it makes us, it may, it's a perception, it's neutral, it gets cognitively interpreted as fear, which then brings in a whole flood. What do you think that does to our motor system? Is it achievement-focused or protection-focused? Protection, for sure. 100%. Yep. Okay, that's a completely different model. So under protection, we get more cortisol, we get more other stuff. But what do we get under achievement? You said it earlier. It's dopamine. Oh, right. Okay. So under achievement, hitting those small goals, it's a dopamine release. Hmm. Why does the body secrete cortisol? Do y'all know? Oh, it gives you, well, initially it gives you more energy. For what? Fight or flight. Yep. To protect. Hmm. So it's preparing, it's, it's, it's just creating a little bit more protection. But when we're achievement focused, we get that tunnel vision. It's like people say, if you get in that flow state and you get out there the number one step, if you read the book uh, Rise to Superman by awesome Stephen Collins. Okay. We interviewed uh, Stephen. Yeah, fascinating. Steel mm-hmm. and Fire is great, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and you guys interviewed the co-author, didn't you? Yeah, Jimmy yeah. yeah. Wheel also. Yeah. Both of them. Yeah, both of them. Yeah. Um, what's fascinating to me about that is it takes the first step is acceptance. And when we can't accept the outcome, we're never in, a, in, an, open, in an open you know, explosion into success. When we cannot accept the outcome either way. Then we go into protective mode and we're trying to save face. We have to be willing to accept whatever happens. And I would love for you to, before you go on stage, to go, you know what, guys? I may bomb. Right. But I'm giving them everything I have today. Mm-hmm. And if I bomb, I'll deal with it. What's the worst case? They're going to rip me on social media. They're going to say we're frauds. That's fine. I can learn to deal with it. But you know what? I'm going to give them. And for you, I'm going to give them everything I got. And if they like it, they do. Mm-hmm. I may have one person who likes me. Well, that's cool. There may be something wrong with that guy, though. <laughs> it's yeah. one more than I had yesterday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Excellent, man. Sweet. Always great talking to you. Dude, this yes. is great. Uh, right. Thanks for – let's do this. You're a lot of yeah. fun, man. Do you, you, you want to sign off? You want us to sign off here? <laughs> I usually sign off on our show, but I don't know whose show this is. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's the – like we said before, it's the Law & Order Homicide crossover. That's um, right. Yeah, we'll, we'll do formal. What we'll, we'll do is we'll do we'll a do formal. Our yeah, we'll do our, formal. Yeah, we'll do our form- – I'll do the formal one, too. But, look, it's a pleasure to be here, and – 
And I'm always fascinated by seeing entrepreneurs who have a vision of what they want to do and are innovators. Innovation starts in the mind, always. You know, I, I, I look back before we sign off, but you look at Disney World. Could that be built today? Hmm. Not really. Doubt it. Because everyone would tell him why it would fail. Mm-hmm. Yep. But that man started with a vision and a dream. And that vision and dream kept growing with other people who got on board with that dream. And that's what we are. All right. Excellent. Cool. Appreciate it. Thank Check you. this out. Go to mindpumpmedia.com. 30 days of coaching still for free. Also, find us on Instagram. You can actually ask us questions on Instagram and check out our Insta stories. We run promos all the time. You can find it at Mind Pump Media. You can find my personal page at Mind Pump Sal, Adam's at Mind Pump Adam, and Justin's at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.